Angus cow. There it is. I got a man crush on that bull. Is that possible? <laughs> That's a specimen. Where does the best meat in the world come from? It comes from me, Mr. Meat Master, Rafael Hernandez. I'm a beef salesman. I travel around the globe selling the best beef in the world to the best chefs in the world. I started from nothing and I put everything I have into growing my business. From the ranches to the packing plants to the restaurants. Every deal and every relationship counts. It's like the stock market, you're trying to guess. It's a battle for the appetites of the world. It's a new way of eating and a new understanding of where our food comes from. Life is beautiful. Taste it. No, no, definitely. So, so let's line it up. I'll, I'll let you know the days, get a bit specific, and I'll email that to you next Tuesday. Yeah, as you can imagine, with, with everything going on, man, people are opening up, and yeah. uh, my schedule's filling up pretty quick. Pretty quick. I'm Rafael Hernandez, better known as Mr. Meat Master. I'm the director of Sales International, a premium meat broker's company. I'm the guy that finds the best beef in the world and sells it to the high-end restaurants and top chefs. The beef industry is no different from every other business affected by COVID-19. The whole industry came to a halt due to restaurant and hospitality shutdowns. But with pandemic restrictions finally lifting, it's a race to get back in front of the customer. This means working to establish new clientele. Mexico is my focus now. And if we're successful, the reward will be spectacular. But before I meet my new clients, I need to return to the American Great Plains to reconnect with my partners. You order ribeyes, you order fillets, whatever you want. I'll be visiting three facilities in Oklahoma and Kansas. Express Ranch, Tiffany Cattle Company, and Creekstone Farms. They are all vital partners of my farm-to-table philosophy. My parents came from very small beginnings. They were migrant workers picking tomatoes, cucumbers. This is where I came from. So I said, I need a job. So I had to go out there and learn about meat. People would call me on the phone and ask me, hey, I need a load of ribeyes. I don't know what a ribeye was 26 years ago. I took it upon myself to go to Winn-Dixie back in the day and went and bought meat and asked questions to the guy at the butcher shop. And hey, what's a ribeye? It was a humble beginning and coming up as a business, I just fell in love with it. I said, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. So when I started Salsa back in 2011, I knew how to sell meat, but I wanted to change it. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to be someone that represents the best brands in the world. I wanted to change the way people ate. I wanted to change the way people treated animals. More because of my upbringing. Uh, we grew up in farms. We grew up picking tomatoes, cucumbers. So the natural organic way was in my roots. I started with a $20,000 loan that I got from a bank. Uh, in the beginning, it was a little tough. Picked up a phone for suppliers that have been attending to me for the past 25 years. And the next phone call was, well, Raphael, I don't think we sell what you want. And I decided that, you know, uh, either I'm keeping this road or, you know what, I'm going to die trying. Now I have more than 27 people depending on me, families. It's a big responsibility. It's scary, but fun. So why are we going to Kansas? Because when you talk to these high-end chefs and they ask that one particular question and you don't have an answer, that could be your last question. To me, it is important to have every aspect of every question answered. I go out to the ranches, I speak to the ranchers, and I speak to the plants. I represent those brands. I need to know everything about it. Oklahoma, here we are. My first stop, Express Ranch, a prestigious cattle, genetics, and breeding facility. Here, the farm to table truly begins. My partner, Creekstone Farms, is joining me today. Wait, 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 wait. What? What's that? What is it? Arkansas? Arkansas. I gotta get it right because you guys are. So it's Wednesday morning. We just came from Ark City, Kansas. It's about a three and a half hour drive down to Yukon. And uh, we're sitting at the Express Ranch. 
Uh, you look at these ranches, and, and this is where it all started. How are you guys Morning. today? Good morning. Good morning. How's it going, Ryan? Good. Raphael, we're in. Raphael? Alfonso, nice to meet you. Alfonso? Dan Stewart. Dan? Good to see you guys. Glad to have you here at Express today. Thank you. Thank Hopefully you. we have a good tour. Try to answer any questions you might have today. How are you doing? It's peaceful. I'm a city slicker when I head out there, and I, I love seeing the green pastures and just I don't see any uh, sidewalks, which is crazy to me. These, these guys know automatically when you don't belong to those ranches out there. Appreciate the time. Hey, what kind of shoes you got on there? They look comfortable. <laughs> what are they? Louis Vuitton shoes. Louis Vuitton. <laughs> what? Louis, Louis Vuitton. <laughs> It yeah, costs kind of, too much. Yeah, very much. <laughs> That's okay. We calve about 3,000 uh, purebred Angus a year, registered Angus a year, and uh, my responsibilities would include the selection and management of the cattle and also organizing and overseeing uh, the people that take care of them. I'm going to join you guys in about an hour. I've got a meeting, but Donnie will show you around. Thank you. Thank you, Appreciate Darryl. that. You Thank you, Darrell. <laughs> Our first visit is with the elite breeding bulls. This is like the all-star team of bulls. They provide the male fertilization to inseminate only the country's most select female cattle herds. Yeah, this is the bull called uh, EXAR Stallion. Angus cattle. There it is. I got a man crush on that bull. Is that possible? <laughs> I think I have a man crush hey, on that bull. If I was a cow, that'd be my man right there. Man. <laughs> Where we're at now uh, at the ranch is our herd bull runs. And so this facility is designed for one purpose, and that's to house our elite herd bulls. We actually turn out to service our cows. He's stout. He is a uh, stallion. His yeah. name's stallion. His stallion. His sire it goes is, right uh, his name, huh? Yeah. Stud is his, <laughs> his papa. We're trying to bridge the gap between like how does this specimen, how does mm -hmm. it get into the regular beef supply system, and mm -hmm. what does that rancher look for that's, that that would be a reason that he would use this guy? We find him to be extremely good hipped. He's a bull with some muscle. Uh, he's a bull that's got some depth of body and. Uh, we like him through his shoulder, very sound on his feet and legs. He's got a nice big foot size. Industry-wise, the folks that have used him really like the calves. And that's, that's the bottom line on a bull, is how well you like the calves and, and do those calves uh, generate you know, dollars for you. But for us, uh, he's certainly done a very nice job. And those are the ones that pretty much carry you know, the semen for the, for the cattle out there. And uh, it's astonishing to know they sold over $120,000 for a bull. So just imagine how good this market is. It's surprisingly a new world for me. I'm, I'm learning as, as we go. How, I see. how well, old do they have to be by the time you decide, you know what, that's enough, let's just let them live? On a bull like that, you try to get a, he's, he's four a, years old, he's very yeah, young. You try to, get a, try to get a big semen bank on him because that's primarily your insurance on the bull. Then he'll uh, just live the rest of his life around here. Just live the rest of his yeah. life here. Yeah, he just wants to rub. Nobody you know, bothers him. Nobody bothers him. Yeah. All the hay he wants. It's like my father's day. Right? Yeah. That's, what yeah. That's his father's day. So how long would the semen last once you freeze it? Forever. As Forever. long as your tank does not grow dry. So his like genetic make line could be from here to eternity as long eternity. as it keeps going. Yep. Yep. Wow. Part of what people select for is the size of the testicles. Correlates with fertility. The more production that they have, the more Babies hit the ground. <laughs> Ride them, cowboy. Those bulls were gorgeous. Never seen bulls that way. You know, uh, two, three thousand pound bulls, genetically correct Angus cattle. These guys are growing 1,500, 1,200 head a day. I mean, that's the top of the line. 2,000 pounds. 2,000 pounds. Cattle yeah, this way? No, they're going to bring them this way. That, that set of pins down there. Okay. We're gonna see him go by. Yeah, we should see him go by. Uh, these cows are bred to what we feel like are some of the best bulls in the breed. These Angus cattle are amazing creatures. They can stand a tremendous variation in climatic conditions from extreme heat over 100 degrees Fahrenheit to extreme cold 30 or 40 below zero. Each and every year, it's, it's, it's really not like a box of Cracker Jacks, but it's somewhat like that. And, and probably the beautiful part of it is, no matter how good you think you get at it, you never conquer it. There's always something that you need to improve upon. And so we're trying to make the best cattle that we can make. And so it's just a constant merry-go-round in terms of breeding, calving, 
developing marketing. Beautiful, beautiful day, beautiful cat. That's what we like doing. They took us along the lines, they showed us all the animals, the embryos, how everything is being done. This ranch that's doing genetically correct Angus cattle. Just a better way of eating, a better way of cattle, a better way of treatment, an overall better way of everything. With a visit to Express Ranch complete, our next stop is Tiffany Cattle Company. Tiffany Cattle Company is a feedlot that specializes in black Angus. The goal of the feedlot is simple, mature and put weight on the cattle. Tiffany is one of those ranchers that does a lot of work for Creekstone Farms. So we're going to take you out there, show you a little of what's happening in that, in that feedlot. Let's uh, head out there and see what's going on. Good to see ya. How you, how you been, man? Good, good. How you doing? Let's, Let's go look at some cattle. Yeah, Let's love to. Good. That's what we're here. Let's right, get this done. Awesome. Follow you guys. Yeah. Let's do it. You know, so why is Kansas considered one of those best places to grow cattle? So first of all, the climate. They have those long winters, long springs, and very small summers. So it brings less stress to the animal. They're happier, healthier, and they eat more. And then we have those long virgin meadows, and all that limestone in between brings that great nutrition to the grass. It is a heaven for these animals. So what you guys are seeing in the background here is our cowboys are going out today and they're checking on grass cattle. We're in the Flint Hills region of Kansas, which is primarily grass. What we do is we intensively graze that grass for a 90 day period. So we kick these cattle out, they're weighing about 600 pounds. We'll gather them in 90 days, so we'll be weighing about 850. And so when they're done with grass here, we'll take them back into the feedlot and that's where we'll put them on full feed and finish them. <laughs> Picked a good day. Thought it was gonna be raining, but it's gonna work out. It's beautiful. Cowboying is a skill. You know, Sean and I always feel like we can pretty adequately train anyone to drive a feed truck, but in the feedlot situation, the animal health side, it's kind of one of those things to where you almost have to grow up around them. It's really hard to identify when one's sick or when one's hurt because they have a God-given mechanism to where they mask their symptoms, right? Before we started domesticating them, the wolves would follow and pick out the ones that were weak or injured. And so they have this ability to mask that. And so our cowboys are highly skilled. They can identify those injured or sick cattle that need our help, which is crucial to get an effective treatment. They become like a cow whisperer. So these guys are just uh, in between the cattle and just by looking at them, they know when someone's sick. Something happens with one of them, one of them is sick, they could endanger the rest of the herd. A lot is happening in the shipping and receiving area. They have to load and unload a hundred cattle per hour. And one slip up could be disastrous. So what we're looking at behind us is our shipping and receiving facility. Everything that we do is based off of trying to keep them as gentle and as calm as we can so that they flow. Depending on where they want that animal to go, these guys have partly instinct but partly learned as they've grown up with it. They just move their body in order to put pressure on these animals to shove them where they want them to go and, and do it without ramming and rodding kind of the way you see in the movies. That's not the best way to do it. At the end of the day, you know, people don't really know how that steak gets to the plate. Yeah. So, you know, it's the your process that you're talking about. Then it goes down to the, you know, Creekstone Farms where... When a rancher decides that he wants these genetics in his herd and he makes the decision to breed a particular cow to a particular bull to ultimately become a great steak, there's nine months of gestation. Sure. Then you have another nine months roughly on average before that animal comes here to the feedlot. And then another five months to finish that animal before it hits Creekstone. And then a couple more weeks before it ends up in the grocery store case or on a plate in a restaurant. And so you're talking about a two year process. And so that makes the beef industry radically different than any other segment of the protein industry. Cattle coming in, cattle going out. Weight's how you get paid in this industry. Yeah, we get paid by the weight of the cattle. We sell the feed by the way, everything. When we grew up in the feedlot, dad's number one rule of, if you're close to the scale, weigh it. Weigh it. <laughs> <laughs> My brother and I are the first on the Tiffany side to have ownership in this industry. We take a great deal of pride in that. Our first facility, our dad was actually the assistant manager when we were kids, so we grew up working here. 
we grew up doing all the nasty grunt work and the dirtiest jobs you can imagine. And, and Dad one time jokingly said he made us do all of those things so we didn't grow up and manage a feed yard. But uh, we didn't dodge that bullet. We love what we do. Uh, we're proud to serve cattlemen and women from across the United States, but uh, also proud to give people an incredible dining experience. So in the 90s, we had the grid-based marketing systems where we actually started to get rewarded for higher value cattle, higher quality cattle. I just started and, to notice it was And so when we did that, yeah, we, when the target was set that we wanted 80% choice or better, right? We started so what making, do we do right with these? Exactly. We started yeah. making genetic changes on the cow-calf level, but we also started to realize that cattle handling and low stress started to make a tremendous impact on those quality grades too. And so the whole industry shifted because our product is much more consistent and higher quality across the board. So that's pretty amazing. We need to be really calm and gentle when we're loading those fat animals just out as they're getting on the truck just before harvest too. Because once again, if we stress them out and they release those endorphins into their bloodstream, it, it, it will impact meat quality and it can also impact the meat color. You'll, you hear about dark cutters, well those happen when animals get too stressed. And so everything that we do is focused on their well-being and just handling that stress load. We don't want them out running the fences or things like that, burning calories. We want them gentle and calm and, and gaining as fast as we can. Everything that we do is focused on managing that stress. It's good yeah. and they know it's good. They'll pay for it. No, absolutely. It's, well, the market has changed over 20 years. Sure. It's a big yeah. difference than what people are yeah. looking at, eating. It's a whole big thing. Obviously, as an industry, we need to provide a consistent product for the consumer. And so, ultimately, the consumer sets that target. And companies like Creekstone will pay premiums for whatever that target is. And so then it's, it, the onus is on us and then on our customers when they're making breeding decisions back at the ranch in order to not only breed and produce cattle that will hit those targets, but then our responsibility is to feed them to hit those targets. And uh, our beef is gonna be going into very high-end retail and we have a reputation for feeding the best of the best cattle in the industry. So <laughs> feed yards are an incredibly dynamic place. I mean, just in the short time you've been here today, you've seen trucks delivering cattle, you've seen trucks taking cattle away, you've seen feed coming in, feed trucks going this way and the other loaders going, and you've just seen the tip of the iceberg. You know, you gotta be on your toes when you're in a feedlot because you just never know when a truck's gonna come around the corner or a steer or a cowboy horseback. And you know, we've got a windy day today. Folks that aren't from here might call this windy. We kind of call this normal. People don't get into this industry because it's easy. This is not an easy profession. And I don't care if you're the owner or in an entry level position. People get into this industry because they're passionate. They're passionate about caring for animals and they're proud to show up to work every day and help produce food for our planet. And you know, there's a lot of satisfaction and pride in working in agriculture and especially the feed yard industry. Not every cattle meets Creekstone Farms and Mr. Meat Masters quality standards. Maybe only 1% pass the cut. So this pin in particular is exactly what Creekstone's looking for. It's just really boxy in appearance. Deep in the brisket, deep in the flank. You can just see that these are gonna be extremely high quality and exactly what Creekstone's looking for. What about your customer base with the Angus cattle? Have you noticed the difference between the softness of the meat always? The low stress cattle handling, the high quality, feedstuffs and then the genetics that are the foundation to it all right when done correctly yeah. leads to that quality product that we all want. I think people will realize a little more and more about how important it is and how tough it is for that piece of meat to get to your table. It, it's an extraneous amount of work to make sure that chef slices that piece of meat, loves a piece of meat, but yet where does it come from? It was a great visit to Tiffany Cattle Company. Next stop our partner Creekstone Farms Premium Beef. Creekstone Farms is a beef processing facility that receives much of its beef from Tiffany Cattle Company. It involves several stages including grading, cutting, packaging and chipping. First we head to cattle receiving. So it all starts with cattle receiving. The animals are brought in, 
that's the first step, number one. We can't do anything without getting the animals into the facility. So cattle receiving is basically the indoor cattle pens, indoor corrals where the, where the animals come in and rest. We don't process them immediately. We want them to settle down. If cattle are, have adrenaline flowing, when at the point of the, of the sacrifice, it's gonna create tough beef because that adrenaline is flowing through the body. See, they're calm, they're relaxed. There's no mooing going on. They're pretty much just hanging out. It's all about humane handling all the way throughout the process from the farm to the feedlot to here. At the end of the day, these animals are making this ultimate sacrifice for us. So we want to treat them with the utmost respect for making that sacrifice. Craigstone Farms really likes to uh, keep everything they do, uh, uh, not secretly, but at the end of the day, it's business. So having them share their animals and the way they're being treated and, you know, and just pretty much open up to the public is something new that most people won't see. After that, it goes into our harvest area. Our harvest area is basically consists of the hide removal and the uh, cleaning up of the carcass, basically. Next comes the grading. From then on, it goes into that grading area where the carcasses have already been split into two. Every carcass is graded by USDA standards. Creekstone Farms hopes for the highest grade possible. The grader inspects the, the ribeye, assigns a stamp of a, a quality grade, whether it be select, choice, prime, and they move on from there. So based on this marbling, and marbling is the flakes of fat inside that muscle, the amount of fat in that muscle creates the high quality grade. So, so the whole carcass quality is based on that ribeye. So it's what we call marbling. So the marbling is actually the white fat specks inside that muscle. The more white flakes in it, the higher the quality. That's all metered off this white fat within inside that muscle. Look at the marbling. Yeah, look at the marbling on that. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Once the top percentage of the beef is identified, it goes to the cutting stations. The cutters are like beef samurais. So here's where the carcass comes in and we start dis disassembling the car carcass going through. Each line throughout the process, its job is to disassemble a certain portion of that carcass. You gotta have a technique. If you don't do it right, you can't make a good sirloin. It's gotta be right. So this guy, it's technique. That's a big, massive saw. And it's so heavy that it's got to be on a cable system. As you can see, if he does it right, it breaks that kneecap. Not exactly a kneecap, the joint. Yeah. Off of it, and see all that, that liquor coming off? That's a perfect cut. And see how it's always at an angle? Leaves the bone. That's it. Leaves the bone intact. Yeah. Yes. These guys are talented enough. They know where that seam is, where the muscle separates. And, they do that. and then they use gravity to help them separate it. Use the knife and gravity so they're working smarter, not harder to do the job. So it's about you know, 1,200 workers in line and uh, uh, everybody has their designated job. And you know, just the way they grab those knives and, and they go through a piece. I think they measured it once and it was maybe two and a half minutes to slice up a whole uh, cattle. It's like your tool belt, right? Your knives are, are, are part of your whole ensemble and you're part of your doing your work. You have straight knives, you have stiff knives, you have flex knives. Obviously the ones that are trimming just meat can keep an edge or a knife sharper than those that are trimming, say, deboning items or moving knives around bones. Uh, so the stiff knives are more for the boneless type folks that are just trimming meat. Following the cutting stage, the beef is sealed. This is highly important because any slip up could reduce the shelf life to only five days. Too little time for shipments. These are our big vacuum seal machines. So everything that we make gets bagged, vacuum sealed for freshness. Uh, so we can have, help that shelf life sell. Depending on what the process is, we have a further processing area where some of the product goes into ground beef. And we make ground beef for food service, patties, uh, retail. So here you see the finished product it comes through here, vacuum sealed, nice and beautiful. There's paper between. You know, I had been in many meetings with Creekstone before and, and more on the sales side than anything else. You know, sitting down in Creekstone Farms and having to uh, sit with the CEOs, directors of the company, just gives me um, good feedback about the job I'm doing for them. And I think they're happy and it makes me happy. But how does the note pick up pretty buck from there too, from there? After the beef is sealed, 
It's boxed and prepared for shipment. You build an order on the computer by code, by pack date. It's amazing, you know, being one of the smallest plants in the world and the amazing technology coming into this plant. It's, it's quite impressive what Crickstone Farms is doing. It changed everything that's happening. Crickstone Farms uh, gets better and better every year. Now they've implemented this new machine, which really it's state of the art. You know, it's, it's almost a full automated warehouse. By scans and orders, it starts forming a pallet and going between rooms and rooms of cold storage and boxes of different items, so it's amazing. Wraps it nice and tight. And then from here on out, you can literally put it right onto the truck. Once it's processed, it goes into these trucks and straight to delivery. Then the clock starts ticking, and that's where we take effect. Reconnecting with Creekstone Farms and our Farm to Table partners has been amazing. With the day closing, we decided to celebrate our visit at Bass Restaurant, one of Oklahoma's finest restaurants. And Bass just happens to be the customer of Creekstone Farms. We meet the executive chef and head chef. They're true masters of their craft. Hi, I'm Chef Kurt Fleischfresser, Director of Operations at VAST here in Oklahoma City. We're at 726 feet above the ground, and we are kind of the jewel of Oklahoma City. We're the only four diamond AAA restaurant in Oklahoma City, and we enjoy serving Oklahoma-style food to Oklahoma people. Actually, the chef's going to pull out some pieces of meat for us, show us what he's doing, you know, and all that Greek on stuff, so it's going to be amazing. And instead of putting, like, butter on stuff, when people, a lot of steakhouses put butter and stuff, well, butter has a really low burning point, so it winds up kind of tasting scorched. We take that smoked prime beef fat with the garlic in it and everything else, and we brush our steaks with that. So way above the burning point, and you still get that flavor and the moisture. So one of the things that we love on our menu is a smoked prime strip from Creekstone. We season it just salt, pepper, and a little smoked beef fat. Gives it a nice, smoky, a wood grilled, almost charcoal grilled flavor. And it's a really unique flavor that we give the Creekstone steak. A little you know, people a little say, more about the medium. People say, you know, all the time, you know, oh, it's so juicy, it's so tender. I want to hear beefy. I mean, yeah. I, want, I want somebody to tell me that this tastes like beef. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like to have a little tooth to it. And, you, you know, really like passion on the plate. That's the kind of people we like to work with. Oh, yeah. 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 Finally, we get to relax and savor our mouth watering steak. What a treat. Chef, I've been looking forward to this one. Sure. You get expectations even higher. Wow. wow. That taste is amazing. Yeah, We're all fortunate. Hey, just my, out of I'm just out of hand. Well, New Zealand. How else do you eat it? That's the only one. There you go. Yeah, baby. So I take that when I clean the lamp. Yeah. 